and welcome to yet another episode of the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. I'm Joe, and with me as always, for the most part, is Nick. Yes. Returning champion uh, from the field. Special guest. Yes, special special, uh, regular guest. Um, For people who are unaware... Uh, Nick was actually gone for the last several weeks, and we had just recorded everything ahead of time. Yeah, it sucked. <laughs> just getting locked in a in, in a recording room with me and a dog for fucking four hours, <laughs> so we could wrap that shit up. Uh, now I continually talk about um when we first started the show, we kind of like spitballed about stuff we always wanted to cover, and one of the things that came up was Napoleon's invasion of Russia in eighteen twelve. And uh, as we got better and better at doing this, I mean, I guess objectively better, some people would say we're not, uh, we realized, like, we might actually be able to pull this off. Like, after we did almost 10 fucking hours of, like, the Soviet-Afghan war, I was like, we might be ready. We might be ready to do this justice. I'm ready for it. It does not help that I did my capstone project for my bachelor's degree on the subject. (laughs) So, I'm already kind of familiar. Oh, it helps. Yeah, yeah. Um... In, in celebration of finally doing something we set out to do almost two years ago, uh, we cracked a bottle of French wine uh, that was uh, grown by French foreign legionnaires in their retirement village. Uh, and before anybody says that we're getting a bit bougie with our money, it was six euro. So <laughs> <laughs> calm down, everybody. Uh, yeah, and it, it goes to um, uh, supporting like the retirement and everything. I think the only rule is like you have to be able to work, you have to be single. And you have to have, like, a, an honorable discharge from the French Foreign Legion. Nice. Yeah. I mean, which, as far as, like, retirement packages for the French Foreign Legion goes, not bad. Because they normally don't really get shit. <laughs> never heard of them getting anything, really. Yeah. I didn't know they had a retirement thing off of wine. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it, in French, it's, like, the, the village of the invalids, uh, which is uh, not the most great way to word that. Because it's, like, uh, mentally disabled, uh, like, PTSD. Um, depression stuff like that physically disabled and retirees uh and yeah and you I'll, I'll put the like the the link to get wine if you want in the show notes they're almost always sold out um i was able to get two bottles um but yeah it's not bad <laughs> it's, it's not it's pretty fucking good i think they've been making wine there since like the roman times so jesus yeah <laughs> uh, now back on subject here on all of our big series we start with the revolution right Pretty much, for the most part. Yeah. With the, I guess with the exception of the, the, the Winter War, there was really no revolution there, unless you cut the Russian Revolution. Um, and this one is uh, as well. So we have to start all the way back at the French Revolution. And I am just fucking kidding. I am not going to do that. <laughs> I am not I was covering about the French. to say. <laughs> anyway, this How is... How many parts will this, this be? This is part 46. Yeah. Uh, and Napoleon is still not emperor yet. Um, uh, you know, like when I... Uh, there's a lot of like popular narratives about this... Um, which is something that we kind of have to kill uh, during this uh, series. Like when I talk to you about the invasion of, of Russia, like what comes to mind to you? World War Two. You're not wrong. <laughs> when it comes to a whole bunch of idiots freezing to death in Russia, yeah. also correct. Yeah, uh, but I mean the the two are often compared. Like you know, are you, they? yeah. I mean, you got the the hubris of a dictator um, thinking way too highly of himself and his war making abilities. Um, and then getting like just completely stomped in by the you know general winter of Russia, um, and that is kind of true, uh, but it's also way dumber than that. And uh, th- I mean the same goes for the Nazis as well. Uh, maybe one day we'll cover Operation Barbarossa. I don't know. That would be like a fucking six month long series. Uh, but like uh, I think the Napoleon's invasion of Russia is far dumber, uh, and, and I guess we can revisit that. I don't know much about it. For sure. Oh boy, do I have some good news for you. Yeah, that's my, <laughs> this is my gift. Yeah. Uh, so before we we dive into one of my favorite topics in all of military European history, um, we have to acknowledge our main source for this entire series, and that's Adam Zamoski's Moscow 1812, Napoleon's Fatal March. Uh, I used it for my capstone project. I've, u- I- I've used it in school for years. I've used it on this show before uh, when we talked about the Continental System during the War of 1812. Uh, It is an awesome book, and I cannot recommend it enough. If there's ever any quotes from anything else, uh, not using that book, uh, I will say so. Instead of continually, if you hear it in the episode, it probably came from this book. Uh, It's a good book? It's it's probably my one of my top five favorite 
historical books I've ever read. Nice. Um, and if you actually are enrolled in a university, I know a lot of our listeners are, you can probably get it for free um, because it is, uh, it's considered a, a pretty normal uh, textbook for classes in oh, European wow. history. Yeah. Like I know I got it for free at first, uh, but I had it on digits and I hate using uh, eBooks for notes because I like to make paper notes because I'm fucking old now. Uh, so I had to go and buy a paper copy <laughs> so I can make a whole bunch of notes in it. So it looks good. Yeah. Uh, it's incredibly unwieldy because like, I, I didn't color code anything when I was using the little note cards. Right. So I have to like flip all of it like through 600 pages or whatever <laughs> and find it. Um, now, we're not going to be talking about the French Revolution, but we kind of are. But there, uh, like most historical fuck ups we talk about, there is a huge backstory that needs to be told. Uh, that ends with uh, you know half a million French people freezing to death in, in Russia. There's a lot of footwork that goes into that. Yeah. The story that begins, uh, the story begins with the guy you've probably heard of, Napoleon Bonaparte, the first uh, emperor of the French Empire. Uh, now, so I consider him something of the patron saint of this podcast. Uh, I am. Uh, he is a problem. Like he is one of my p- problematic historical favorites. Um, like uh, our podcast, Jim has his st- yeah has how has his house standard flying from the wall. Awesome uh, too. Yeah, and looks I, great. And I understand all of the problems that go into liking Napoleon that much. He was a shitty racist, tyrant. <clears throat> yeah, I get that. He's just one of my historical favorites. We're not going to be going into a ton of his personal life, um, but if that is something that you're interested in, there is a podcast called The Age of, Na- Age of Napoleon uh, that is magnificent, and it literally covers his life from his birth, and I'm going to assume all the way to his death. Um, it, like, for instance... French was even his first language. <laughs> Bonaparte was not how you pronounce his last name. It was Bonaparte. He, when he moved into mainland France, he simply switched it so people wouldn't make fun of him. <laughs> I'm French. Yeah, he's, he's Corsican, uh, so he's pretty much Italian. Oh, okay. So, yes, you can do the Napoleon. I thought it was uh, Sicilian or some shit. No, he, he's from the island of Corsica, which uh, he was saved from not being able to be French nobility. Because uh, his his father was someone that was m- a very 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 minorly important person, uh, by only a couple of years, uh, I think it was like uh, a, a year and some change. I could be wrong. Uh, that it was Italy's island, and then it switched to France right before he was born. Uh, so oh, wow. yeah, yep. Calendar kind of changed the course of history. Who would have thought? Uh, but yeah, if, if you want more of that to include how Napoleon got involved in politics and Corsica, which pretty much just involved people shooting each other, uh, you can follow the entire life of, uh, of our favorite little corporal over there. Uh, so instead we will join the emperor who has long since taken the throne and subjugated most of Europe. So I'm going, we're operating under the assumption that you understand that he came from the uh, French revolution. He seized power, made himself emperor. Long story short, yada, 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 yada. He controlled most of the world. <laughs> it's never how my classes were. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, and I think he's one of my problematic favorites because he was virtually a nobody. And he's like, fuck it, I'm emperor now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the nations that had not been taken over by uh, Napoleon and the, and the French Empire directly, uh, had, well, most of the ones that he did had a Bonaparte family member sitting on the throne or he had married into their family, you know, the normal imperial stuff. Uh, but the ones that were not dominated by Napoleon were mostly on their back foot, kind of like England and, uh, and or had been forced into shitty alliances with Napoleon that were not equal. Uh, Napoleon did not look at anybody as France as equal. They were just another power to be subjugated. Which will be problematic, as we will find out. Right. But he is still constantly at war with England. There's a war going on in Spain, uh, where I- England is openly fighting them and uh, fomenting insurrection. It- it's it's a footnote to the larger historical narrative that we're playing here, because he throughout all of this he's worried about. Well, I'm going to be fighting a two front war because you know Spain is still a problem. Yeah. <laughs> then he would end up losing. But I mean, he would end up losing like real hard. But yeah, you know, not yet. Now, more importantly than all of that, Napoleon had begun to cement his dynasty because before then he had no kids. Uh, people thought of that. People called him the Corsican upstart. Uh, one of the main reasons that the French, uh, since the time of the French Revolution, that the, the rest of the European powers had fighting him is because they generally don't like new people that they thought to be much, much lower than sovereigns calling themselves emperors and then just killing the old king. Frowned upon. Yeah. Don't now, like change. Yeah. Uh, they're definitely not. Uh, they're really into fucking their own cousins, though. 
It goes into our yeah. our, our like two year long <laughs> podcast joke where all of uh, the world's problems are pretty much just two inbreds fighting over or like beefing over turf. It's like the South. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's the Civil War, yeah. but with Europe. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, he was now like, you know what? I'm no longer just the Corsican upstart. upstart. I have a dynasty. I have a son. Uh, and yeah, he, in true emperor fashion, the, the, the birth of his son was greeted by the firing of 100 cannons outside of his palace and parties in the street. That would suck. Imagine being on that details. I have to fire how many cannons? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Like people were legitimately ecstatic that uh, that Napoleon had a kid. Well, I dig the parties on the streets. I mean, and there's a certain amount of this, like how many people felt forced to rejoice in their emperor having a kid because party. Napoleon definitely was not a huge fan of freedom of speech or expression. <laughs> so everybody just getting told to party he, or they die. Yeah, he was at one point, uh, but then he became emperor, and he was like, mm, "All these people saying I'm not that cool is kind of a problem." Uh, I wonder if he would ever do an undercover boss. Like, what do you think of Napoleon, like, with a shitty mustache? Yeah. Uh, weird how this strange officer who... Also, he always spoke French with an accent, <laughs> and he never learned how to spell it quite right. Nice. Because he didn't learn... I, I do not think he started to learn French until he was about 10 years old. So, like... Well, eh, you don't like, need to if you're weird, in charge. Weird, the guy sounds kind of Italian. Hey, what you think about that Napoleon? He always talks like this. <laughs> yeah, it's like, sir, could you put your hand down? Oh, yeah, I'm French. Sorry. Now, it probably sounds kind of obvious that the emperor might have an heir, but uh, uh, Napoleon and his first wife could not conceive. uh, So that led them to get a divorce. Uh, Just because of that? Yeah. Was uh, it his idea? Well, it was, and it was a political choice. Like, he, his first wife was absolutely his, like, his lifelong love. And, like, they became, they were friends until the day he died. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. um, And he married again, uh, who was, uh, the person he married the second time was the daughter of the Austrian emperor. uh, And the last emperor of the holy roman empire who was the daughter was raised to believe that he was literally the antichrist <laughs> but like because it was a woman and it was the 1800s hell like, yeah you don't have any rights go marry this weird italian french guy um and and admit it like the book makes it quite uh obvious they that she fucking hated him but they fell in love after they started having sex so i guess napoleon fucked like a champ what <laughs> yeah yeah it was like after they they know the marital bed that she could not pull himself nice. or like napoleon fucked <laughs> like imagine uh fucking so good that someone who literally thought you're the antichrist like mm, you're actually all right you're pretty fucking awesome yeah uh but yeah it was it was definitely a political marriage they did end up loving each other but uh you know for for what it seems like, uh, for uh, the the most loveless political marriages throughout Europe, um, they actually did like each other. Like uh, even in their correspondence, like they're at least friends. Oh, that's good. Yeah, which is more than you can say for most marriages back then that you get kind of sold into. So you're saying he can't spell Fran- French? Yeah. So he, how did they communicate? If she was Austrian. Uh, he spoke. Uh, he spoke decent German and uh, Italian, and he also he had aid write most of his letters, from my understanding. <laughs> Like the, there was a joke that uh, Tsar Alexander of Russia spoke better French than Napoleon. As oh. we'll, we'll get to that as to why, okay. <laughs> but yeah. Now all of this is supposed to be a pretty big deal. Uh, he was hoping that this would be like kind of the silver bullet to finally end all these wars that Fr- France had been involved in since the dawn of the revolution, um, because they wanted to kill the French Revolution. Uh, and now they realize, like, they should have m- maybe realized, like, eh, fuck. He's cemented his rule. He's a dynasty now. We kind of just have to deal with him. He's, he's going to be here. Uh, well, I hope they didn't kill it off. I want to see Led Mezerobs again. Well, unfortunately, they did do a pretty good job of that. Well, Napoleon did a pretty good job of ki- of killing the revolution in itself, uh, but it's a different argument. Do you for enjoy Led Mezerobs or Les Mezerobs? Uh, I was a pretty big fan of Les Mis. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a musical guy, uh, but, I mean, I like you Sweeney like Todd, too. Chops? I'm a pretty big Hugh Jackman fan. Now, if you make Les Mis and have Hugh Jackman again and just have him play Wolverine, that's what I was man, thinking too. He just starts stabbing his enemies <laughs> with his fucking hand claws. I was thinking that too. Uh, yeah, but like Napoleon's whole thought is like, finally, this is going to end because they have to deal with me. Like they realize that the Bonapartes are going to are, are just a part of France now. Um, King of Big Dick is here. Yeah, Big Dick, Big Dick Emperor Energy. Uh, well, now most people would think as Napoleon is an insane despot, desperately attempting to take over the world. Uh, he thought of his wars as defensive, which, I mean, I would if you're listening to this and you're American, 
you should understand the cognitive dissonance there, kind of like protecting yourself by invading Afghanistan. Yeah, you got to. Yeah. He, you know, he was to secure France and leave the throne to his heirs. Uh, his idea was, well, if I go out and strike them, they can't attack France. I mean, and many of these countries did invade France during the revolution and then got you know, pushed back. Because the, the wars of the uh, immediately following the French Revolution are a different subject altogether. But yeah, there was all sorts of enemy armies invading France. Uh, but what little aspect of that you can give to Napoleon, say, you, you guess you kind of have to hand it to him, quickly evaporates as the story goes on. Uh, also, it's important to point out here that Napoleon uh, would invade Russia, that would eventually invade Russia, was not the same Napoleon that stormed through Europe. Uh, he was in his 40s now. He had gotten kind of fat. His mind was beginning to slip. Oh. He was aging. Um, began to speak a bit slower. Uh, it took him longer to make choices. Uh, instead of being whip smart and liable to snap at people who pissed him off and like in a, in a constructive way, like a constructive uh, criticism that was immediate, he was kind of pensive and hesitant and would just kind of get mad without any uh, ideas of how to solve problems. He just wanted to yell and be mad. Hell yeah. No, I mean, we're, we're like, well, he's 40. That's not that old. That's true. There's, he's going to be fighting people in charge of the, the Russian army who are much older. But as, he was beginning to slip. He couldn't concentrate on a task for more than a few hours or a few minutes at a time, even though he was known for virtually never sleeping and studying maps and ideas and tactics for hours on end before. Uh, he, was, he had a bit of an incredibly unhealthy life, as you would imagine. Someone who takes over He's the really world. Really big into have. work. He had an insane work ethic. God. Like, he, like during the invasion of Russia, he's only sleeping a couple hours a night, hey. which is a problem because that means he takes all the stuff onto himself rather than passing things to his secondary in command. Yeah, it seems like his generals don't take charge. That will become a problem, <laughs> which we will get into. Or, or he had built such a dependency on Napoleon, the brilliant strategist. That his generals never really had to learn for themselves. We just wear the rank. We don't really do anything. You n- you have no idea how right you are. <laughs> oh, I heard to laugh. <laughs> now, there's a good reason that Napoleon himself felt himself slipping, as uh, like he was gr- he was desperately grasping for a settlement for these decades decades long con- continent wide war that he couldn't seem to figure out how to end. Um, which again. For like the third time brings us to the continental system. Now, I'll give this a quick once over for people who are just joining us because uh, I've talked about this a lot. The continental system, for people who don't remember, uh, is the really, really dumbass French attempt to enforce a continent wide embargo uh, on the English. Now, the main threat to the French was the British. Mm. Uh, they just wouldn't stop want- trying to fight him. And more importantly, the the English knew the best way they could fight France was to prop up people that were actively fighting them with money, trade, stuff like that. It's called the Golden Cavalry. Okay. Um, also, they would deploy soldiers pretty much wherever someone's like, fuck you, Napoleon, British soldiers would pop up. <laughs> hey. Yeah. yeah, I was like, what's up? <laughs> uh, and the problem, another problem was that France knew they couldn't like stop them from doing that because the, the British... Navy absolutely fucking destroyed Napoleon at Trafalgar. Right. So, like, confronting them straight up was simply not an option. Uh, so, the attempted to destroy Britain economically and uh, being the premier superpower of the mainland, of you know, mainland Europe through, uh, through arms, Napoleon decided, like, well, fuck it. They control the seas. We can't help that. But I control Europe. So, I'm just going to m- make sure nobody can import any of their stuff. Now, in case you're wondering, a continent-wide embargo would be hard in 2020. It would be extremely hard. It is fucking fight. impossible in 1812. <laughs> he simply made it up an idea that was completely unenforceable. This would be like if he was like, nobody can use forks. Sir, how are we going to inspect and ensure people are doing this? Well, I'm the emperor, and I'm telling them not to do it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> but yes, how yes, are we yes, going to yes. enforce this? And then everybody around him's like, "Yeah, sure, cool." Yeah. They're all just gutless, gutless sick. Sounds good. Yeah. Great idea. Huh. Yeah. I mean, the French emperor, the French Empire was fucking massive, and the there was ports everywhere, so it's pretty much it's as easy to smuggle something from England into the continent of Europe as it is to just pull your goddamn ship in and bribe somebody. 
Uh, because that was the other option, is bribe the French custom officials. That seems pretty easy. Like, hey, I got some baguettes here. I need to get some black market baguettes and wine. Uh, even worse was that, as many of the, the, the Napoleonic client states were just like, yeah, we're not going to do that. So it's like, fuck. <laughs> this doesn't sound like a good idea. Yeah, we kind of need their imports. <laughs> yeah. So, no. Uh, more still, the system impacted the very people who Napoleon was in charge of, Rather than the Brits. That's important, too. It's like doing sanctions. Like, whenever you see America, like, we're putting sanctions on Iran or Russia. Do you think that impacts Iranian people or Russian people? Or, like, the, 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 no, the, people, the people in, uh, uh, like in power in Iran or Russia? No, it impacts the people who go to the fucking grocery store and buy goddamn food. It's the same thing that happened with the Continental System. It wasn't impacting England. It was impacting his, all of the people that technically fell under his throne that didn't have money. Um... Like, the German states begin to get so pissy uh, that, like, they were just like, yeah, I guess we're just not going to do it. Uh, and the, it, the the problem was is the, the relationship between Napoleon and all his various powers was pretty fucking tentative. It, it pretty much just depended on not them liking Napoleon because a lot of them fucking hated him. It was like, well, we have no choice because <laughs> he'll just come in here and stomp us again. Yeah, he's kind of in charge. Another important client of that was Russia, who we'll talk about in a little bit. Now, Russia was not a traditional ally of France. It wasn't really a traditional ally of anybody. Nobody really gave a shit because they were supposed to be some backward swamp people that the rest of Europe kind of just thought as an afterthought. They didn't really have any power. Yeah, what is Napoleon's like, reasoning for invading Russia? Oh, we'll get there. It is as dumb as like, you can imagine. I don't imagine. understand. This is why I say at least the Nazis had a plan. Like, I really hate to be the guys like, you kind of have to hand it to Hitler. He just wanted to take over Russia. <laughs> Right. Not so simple with Napoleon. Somehow dumber than Hitler. Did he just wake up one day like, hmm. Kind of. <laughs> we'll get there. Now, uh, Russia was beginning to become a European power that people like England and everybody else kind of wanted to talk to in around 1801. Um, and that was when... Hold uh, on, 1801. Yeah. This is only part one. Yeah. And a war doesn't start until 1812. I know. This is dog <laughs> shit. I have questions for when the war starts. We'll get there. Uh, now, at that, at, in 1801, General Bonaparte was acting as first consul. He was an emperor yet. And he reached out to Tsar Paul. Uh, my because, rank on Call of Duty. Because uh, Tsar or first consul? First consul. <laughs> That's pretty solid, actually. Yeah. Uh, congrats badass. Congrats on your future, future seizure <laughs> you of the Call of anymore. Duty throne. Yeah, you're going to be the new emperor of Call of Duty, which I think just means you yell racial slurs louder than anybody else. <laughs> That's the only way to win in Call of Duty. You just got to be louder. Now, like The main reason that uh, France reached out to Russia was because they were desperate for allies. Napoleon was kind of sick of fighting everybody. And was he? He knew it wasn't a winning strategy. <laughs> like, I seemed to like it. I can't fight everybody forever. Now, remember, I said he got dumber as he got older. Right. As we all do. And he reached out to Russia, um, the Tsar, which was Paul at the time. Um, now, this is a problem because Paul was kind of dumb and legitimately insane. Uh, and he was eventually dragged into his bedroom and murdered by his generals, leading to his son, Alexander, to become czar. What? Now, Alexander didn't entirely inherit the, his, his father's insanity, but he did inherit a lot of emotional baggage from being the son of an abusive parent who was mentally unwell. Right. Um, now, this was controlled by his somewhat decent education uh, and a good dose of just horrible emotional abuse by his grandmother, Catherine the Great. Who uh, now? We both kind of come from weird households, but just think about this: Catherine the Great, who is his grandmother, forced him to keep a journal of every single time he failed at anything, and every night before he went to bed, he was forced to read it. <laughs> what? <laughs> he called it his archive of shame. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh fuck, that's cool. Now, Alex, before you go to bed, did you read all of the things you suck at? No, Grandma. Well, you better get to it. Also, like, all of the physical abuse, too. So, like, Alex has some baggage. I could not masturbate today. So, yeah, I tried to jerk off, and I only had a softie. Now, uh, something that was not in his big book of failures was the time he helped a group of generals kill his own father. Because, yeah, he did that. Oh, he helped. Yeah. He was a part of it. <laughs> and everybody knew it. <laughs> like, it was common in Russia. like, yeah, the Tsar killed his dad. But also, it should be pointed out, that was not uncommon in Russia either. Like, for, like, patricide. That just seems normal. Patricide and fratricide, like, you know, uh, 
it was not unheard of for rulers to kill their sons or their sons to kill their dads. Fuck, Stalin committed his son to die yeah. in a Nazi camp. So, like, eh. Said, fuck you. Now, Alexander's only 23 years old, uh, but he wanted to fundamentally reform Russia. This included hiring, uh, hiring people who knew how to run governance and professionalizing it. Uh, like this, this is going to sound kind of dumb because you're used to something that looks like a government, but he instituted uh, institutional structures like government departments and ministries, which simply did not exist before. Uh, like prior to this nobility would just kind of run whatever they wanted to run. Like, Hey Nick, you want to run the army? Yeah, sure. Okay. You're in charge of the army. There's no ministry of defense. Yeah. I don't really need to do anything. You're just kind of in charge of army stuff. Like (laughs) whatever you want, really. And only because you're like my cousin, not because you're good at it. Though. Yeah, you don't need to be good at it. And, and that, that's something he tried to fix. Like uh, he he wanted uh, like you had to have gone to school and pass a test to be in the government. And people are like, whoa, 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 whoa! You want me to do what? <laughs> that was like a big problem for the nobility. It's like, you want me questions. to be good at this? I don't fucking know. I mean, uh, civil service tests are, are nothing new. Uh, they date all the way back to like uh, I think like Wu China. Like they're Pretty old. Uh, but I guess in Russia, they were cutting edge. Nice. Yeah. It, as involved as Alex was in his internal reforms, early in his rule, he was kind of simple when it came to foreign policy and easily. He's 23 years old. So, like, I was pretty dumb when I was 23. I can't imagine I've been a good czar. I'm 31. I would be a great czar. Elect me czar 2020. <laughs> uh, now, he came up with an idea of, like, a new Europe. Uh, ruled by liberal states that w- uh, that and that was an idea that the British Prime Minister again named Pitt wanted absolutely nothing to do with. He thought it was really stupid, but he just lied to Alexander. He's like, "Yes, I totally agree. We should team up and do that by kicking Napoleon's ass." Oh yeah, great idea. And then Alexander was like, "Hey, he's treating me as an equal. I'm on his side." So in 1805, he went to war with France despite having no fucking reason to do so. Nice. And then got his ass kicked. Uh, you can assume this is kind of just what happens when a 23-year-old is put in charge of a country just, just because of who his dad was. Uh, I feel like maybe he should have had a left seat, right seat type of deal. Yeah. Maybe learn. And maybe, like, I don't know, elect someone competent. Yeah. Uh, and or, he could just sit there and be the face. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of how the prime, prime minister pit existed. They still had a king. Um, now... If you're thinking, like, why didn't he have advisors or members of the court that was like, Alex, this is a really bad idea. Literally all of them did. They're like, yeah, we should not fight Napoleon. Uh, Because he's like, the the prime minister is just lying to you so he could use you. And he's like, no, my bro wouldn't do that. Not not pity. Yeah. He's my boy. Uh, And and also, Alex kind of thought himself to be a general, despite not having any education in military matters other than being really into military parades and uniforms. Nice. He is a... He's a reenactor who's really into buttons, but, uh, uh, but he totally swears he could be a field marshal. Change their uniforms again. Yeah. I don't like the way those look. He had, uh, like, he had like, um, uniforms for every regiment in the Russian army. So, like, when he showed up to do, like, parades, he would change into it. Nice. Yeah. Uh, That's awesome. No idea how to lead them, though. Don't need to. Yeah. Was, that, when you look that good? Yeah. Eventually, uh, he did put someone in charge of the Russian army that knew what he was doing, a guy named Mikhail Katuzov. Uh, but then he uh, ignored everything Katuzov told him to do, uh, which was like, hey, a tactical retreat is a good idea sometimes. And uh, it, we'll talk more about how honor shaped the bullshit concepts of honor shaped a lot of military strategy back then. But Alex thought that it would look really bad if the Tsar retreated. Uh, but Alex being in charge of the Russian army led to one of the most legendary Napoleonic victories of all time in Austerlitz. Oh. So way to go. Uh, of course, Kutuzov got all the blame, and then he was sent into exile in a minor government position in Ukraine, uh, and after another de- defeat of the Russian army at Friedland and facing an invasion of Mother Russia herself, the two sides came to meet at the River Tilsit on a raft uh, to come with- On a raft? Yeah, it was like in a floating raft that was like anchored to the shore on the French side. Now, uh, Napoleon did that for a reason. He knew exactly what he was dealing with here. He knew after watching the naive boy emperor of Russia get sucked into a war by the British prime minister, he could probably also take advantage of this fucking idiot. So they're just taking advantage of this guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Alex showed up wearing his best uniform to impress the French emperor while Napoleon set out to literally seduce him into the French cause. Napoleon's wearing sweats and a fucking wife beater. Wearing a tracksuit. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you have a squat? 
I have I hear we Russians really enjoy this. Uh, now Napoleon was not born in royalty, as I point out. He literally created all of that out of thin air through guile, manipulation, and leveraging power. Nice. Alexander didn't stand a fucking chance when it came to negotiating with Napoleon. Uh, he flattered Alexander uh, and Russia in general endlessly. He treated him like an equal rather than a defeated foe, which he absolutely was. Napoleon laid none of the blame of him being involved in the war on him, but rather on Prussia and England, neither of who were invited to that meeting. He only he oh, wanted to get the Tsar nice. alone. Now, they knew what Napoleon was doing to the Tsar. I was like, fuck, he's going to trick our simple boy into being yeah. on his side. So Frederick William III of Prussia did show up uninvited. Uh, they fucking crashed the party? Well, he tried. It was on a raft, and no boat was given to him. So he swam. So he, No, he, he uh, uh, walked his horse. Across like, the water. As deep as he could, like uh, up until like the horse is nearly drowning. <laughs> So he could try to eavesdrop. <laughs> I bet the ease while they're fucking having this meeting, fucking Napoleon's having the little kid play Xbox or something, yeah, trying to get on his side. They just hear a horse outside drowning. <laughs> you hear that? Nope. Turns the Xbox up yeah. louder. You know, if you uh, come back to my place, we can do a, a system link. And I have like four TVs, man. It's sick as fuck. I'm the French emperor. They're like 60 yeah. inches. It's like, bro, no shit. I got a tube TV in Moscow. Yeah, man, you should come over sometime. And, and the TVs are always gray. <laughs> meanwhile, fucking Frederick Williams like, give me more horses to drown. <laughs> yeah. He goes back and gets another horse <laughs> to drown in the same spot. <laughs> Fuck, this one was weak again. <laughs> Now, Alex went from thinking Napoleon was literally evil to thinking he was the greatest He's man who's ever walked the <laughs> yeah, earth. That's awesome. Uh, he wrote to his grandmother, quote, just imagine... Sp- All right. Before I read this, they didn't fuck. I need to lay that out. Hold on. Because <laughs> if you read the Tsar of Russia's letters, it sounds like he and Napoleon were in Do love. Do we know if they... Maybe they just touched tips? I don't know. He's young. He's still experimenting. He hadn't quite figured out his sexuality. Yeah. Uh, now it says, quote, just imagining spending my days with Bonaparte, spending hours quite alone with him. <laughs> I just think he sucks at letters. <laughs> Fellas, is it gay if you hang out with the French emperor alone? <laughs> no. I mean, Napoleon isn't one to, like, literally fuck someone for power. So, like, eh, maybe. Keep it all within the royalty, you know what I'm saying? Now, it should be pointed out that while Napoleon went out of his way to warp Alex to his needs, he ended up actually liking him, too. But, like, the power dynamic was all fucked up. He liked him as, like, an apprentice. He didn't like him oh. as, like, a fellow emperor. No, 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 no. Or as a fuck buddy. Uh, maybe as a fuck buddy. Uh, this is ours 23 years tight. <laughs> yeah, I'm sick of my wife. I need to go hang out with some fucking early <laughs> early 20s strange. <laughs> Sir, you are 40. <laughs> and you are fat. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I could go to Russia. The French girls don't like me anymore. Uh, so he... He talked to Alex about where Russia's borders really should be. He's like, you know, you you should really be out here. Like, you should take over all this. You're Russia. This is yours. Uh, and gave him how like in depth le- lessons of how he could do that. Can you tell him like the ocean, like just claim water. <laughs> yeah. You thought about that? Whoa! And also, he explained him like how he modernized France. Like, this is how you do it by shooting a lot of people. Have you thought about that? Uh, and how he could do the same for Russia. In short, the two became bros. Nice. They, get, they developed one hell of a bromance. Eventually, the Treaty of Tilsit was signed, giving a few islands to France in exchange for a slice of Poland, which was much considered much more important to Russia. More importantly, Russia agreed to join the continental system against Britain. And France took another piece of Poland from Prussia, proclaiming the Grand Duchy of Warsaw as a new satellite state. This will become a huge fucking mistake on Napoleon's part. Uh, it's pretty important to remember or know that Poland at the time, as there are most of history, is continuously fucked by Russia in this situation and is considered part of Russia and an incredibly important part of Russia. It's now split between these two bros. Mm. The treaty made, by, made Alex feel pretty good. But in the end, France was the winner because that's the only kind of deal Napoleon ever made. French troops were stationed in the Grand Duchy right next to Russia, obviously to keep them in check. It also planted the seeds of a new Poland, which had been destroyed only a decade before and made up a huge chunk of the Russian Empire. So many people were unhappy with Russia's deal that his own mother refused to hug him when he came back. Though, 
honestly, that just kind of sounds par for the course for this family so far. Yeah. <laughs> they probably didn't hug. Maybe it was like a, maybe a one shoulder hug. Oh, one of those. Like you keep the other hand in your pocket. Yeah. I don't know. Furthermore, a lot of regular Russian peasants and soldiers were confused. Now, this is because the the Russian Orthodox Church had literally been telling people that Napoleon was the Antichrist. That's awesome. And now their king just went and made a deal with the Antichrist. <laughs> like, nice. why would he do that? Um, Russian nobles got pretty pissed as they thought it was below a real royal line, like. Uh, Alex's family was to be cutting a deal with Napoleon who remember they did not see as their equal. It soon became a pretty common worry that Alex would get his ass stabbed just like his dad did to the point they were openly talking about it. Really? <laughs> yeah. I hope the czar doesn't get killed. I'm sitting right here guys. Yeah. <laughs> this is the knife I would use. Yeah. Right I'd here still. <laughs> I'd stab him like this. Sergey, you killed my dad. Yep. I'm going for a twofer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, There's also something of a hidden problem with the treaty. The treaty was supposed to embody an alliance between two equal powers, France and Russia. But Napoleon did not have allies. He had puppets and vassals. He had no idea how to treat another country as an equal. You can see parallels of that maybe today. Yeah. Uh, Which is why the treaty was inherently unequal in the first place. But the problem was, like, it was supposed to be an understanding between two friends, not like France is the daddy. But that, the, but that was like the only way, only relationship Napoleon ever had was I'm in control of everything. You just shut the fuck up and listen to me, which is why he made himself emperor in the first place. Nice. It forced Russia to stop expanding while triggering an economic war against a former ally. Problem. There was no way that Russia would be able to hold these agreements as it put the Russian imperial throne under way too much pressure from a court that showed it's totally cool with murdering their king if they had to. Sometimes but, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah, like the it's like making a deal with the Praetorian Guard if you're the Emperor of Rome. Like every, someone in this room <laughs> is gonna stab me. Um What year is this taking place? 1805, 1806. So we're still we're, gonna, right. we're gonna do a smash cut forward here in a few minutes. It did not take long for the bromance between the two sides to cool off. The heat of the relationship died down pretty quickly. The honeymoon phase, I guess. I don't know. But Napoleon knew that. Like he was Pretty, uh, uh, he, he was intuitive to his partner's needs. <laughs> and he tried his best to win back his best czar bro. Uh, this includes spending an ungodly amount of money to impress the Russian ambassador, which didn't work because the man fucking hated him and would never even go into the same room as him. What do you do? What do you spend it on? He literally built him his own palace. What? Oh, yeah. Like, uh, the, the book tries to monetize, monetize like how much that would cost in like modern t- modern money hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars what yeah just to impress this one dude who fucking hated him because the ambassador is a noble wow all the fucking nobles hate napoleon with the exception of the czar so it was completely lost on him saw the palace like oh burn it yeah this fucking sucks i'll sleep in my car yeah now, uh, he, but Napoleon wasn't going to give up that easily. Napoleon began to plan random offensives against the British Empire's holdings in India, telling Alex that the Russian and French soldiers would fight side by side to take the crown of the British Empire altogether. Uh, obviously, it never happened. Uh, this is now. This is something Napoleon wanted to do. Like he had always had device. He had designs on India forever. Um, but he knew it was important to make the Tsar feel important and as an equal. Uh, it's like letting him pick where he wants to eat for dinner. Oh yeah, that's but like nice. you, you're like where do you want to eat? How about here? You know, and he'd be like, oh, okay, you really picked where you want to eat for dinner, and you're kind of an asshole. Um, he also began the whole giant dinners, dances, and meetings where his wealth would be lavished on the czar. Like, and it's like, look how important I am. Like, yeah, but also it did kind of work. Um, and he, like any bro, he did try to get Alex laid with members of the European aristocracy. Really, it, the book does not note if he took him up on this offer. <laughs> Bet you he did. I bet you he did. Yep. At one point, they spent an entire two weeks together. Uh, and what That's would. With the letters. <laughs> hey, man, it's, it's the deep, deep romance. Uh, they spent a two weeks together in what would be modern day Germany. Uh, they hung out and Napoleon introduced him to the rest of the European monarchies. Now he introduced them in a way that was like, look at all these bitches who listen to me. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was like, you could be with them. <laughs> like it didn't look good do you want to be one of them like it's described as like he wanted to show alexander how powerful he was and it's kind of an implicit threat 
Like, right. look at everything I have. Do you really want to turn back towards England? Uh, they sat through plays together, and Napoleon had his elite soldiers parade around in front of him, knowing how much Alex liked that that sort of thing. Now I wonder, how did this date? How did they? How did this date happen? Oh, they were sending letters back and forth constantly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then they hung out at another uh, battle site, which is the Battle of Jena. Uh, one it was one, like a, a, a Napoleonic victory that was just legendary, and Alex had questions about it. So he's like, well, why don't we go have lunch at the battlefield? I'll tell you all about it. You see the dead soldiers still there. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even bother to pick them up. I'm that much of a baller. <laughs> Next question. Um, now, Alex made it seem like he still looked up to the French emperor, and then all of this is like, he was just having fun. This is a great time. Uh, it seemed like their bromance is back in full swing. This time, however, this is an elaborate ruse on the part of the czar. He was playing Ooh. Napoleon. The student had become nice. master. Ever since Tilsit, Alex had been uh, fighting to gain respect within his own country. Ha- I mean, hearing nobles literally openly talk shit to him and talk about how he was totally going to get murdered like dad. It's like, hmm, I need to reevaluate how I run this country or I'm going to die. Uh, in order to do this, he had to bide his time. It was around 1808 now. Alex knew he could not just throw down against the strongest empire in the world right, at the time. The only course of action was to mobilize the massive power of Russia and wait for a moment where that power, along with the power of Austria, could be thrown against France because Austria fucking hated Napoleon. Even if at the time they were like, I'll shut up when he leaves. I'll start talking shit again. <laughs> Uh, until then, they had to play the, he had to play the part of the smitten czar that was totally falling in line uh, with all the other monarchs of Europe. I mean, he learned from the, the, the shitty manipulator himself how to do this. Right. He knew Napoleon wouldn't just randomly attack him. The alliance was always a, a much better choice than a war. So as long as he didn't openly threaten France or just like, fuck it, I'm invading you, he would have as much time as he needed. He knew that the, the, the alliance is more to France's need than Russia's and the continental system, all that other shit. Uh, Alex was actually worried that, about Austria launching a war before he was ready to launch a war. Uh, so he went and hung out with Napoleon, making it look like everyone there best froze and scaring the Austrians into keeping their shit together and not going off preemptively. Napoleon had no idea, but he knew Alex had changed. He was more confident, steadfast, and would argue with him, something that did not happen before. Uh, Napoleon was not used to being argued Whoa. with. So, like, when the argument started over Alex's wish to invade the Ottoman Empire, something I personally always encourage, uh, uh, Napoleon took off his hat, hat and threw it at him. <laughs> <laughs> is that a good thing? Like, no, it's oh sweet. He try corn. Whenever uh, Napoleon got mad, he tended to throw his hat at people or like stomp on. I wonder them. if it was heavy. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Isn't it somebody selling? That, that was not that long ago. Someone found a hat that was made for Napoleon. I don't think he ever wore it. And no, it went for yeah. hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Do you think we should get that? Uh, yeah. If, if you want to donate to the Patreon, and our ne- our next uh, Patreon target is half a million dollars a month, get that Chapo money, <laughs> and then I will. I will buy Napoleon's hat. We won't actually, wear it. <laughs> I will uh, claim my right to the, the house of Bonaparte <laughs> if you give me enough money. Where is that house? Other, it's still, uh, like, his family line still exists. Right. And people still, people still claim, uh, like, if the house of Bonaparte was to be restored, mm. I would be emperor. And everyone's like, shut up, dude. Cool guy. Shut up, Pete. Go We're back home. dinner. Yeah. Uh, but then like he threw his hat at Alex and then stomped and flat on the floor. Uh, but Alec, what Alex wanted to do was to make him bad. He wanted to get a rise out of him, see if he could do oh, it. Oh, he did it. Uh, because he, at that point, he's like, fine, fine, I won't, I won't press the expansion issue much past that. This relationship is getting spicy. Uh, yeah, this sparks. Yeah. Eventually, uh, Austria and France would go to war anyway in 1809, ending with uh, Austria getting their shit stomped into the ground and Russia sitting out of it. Mm. Uh, Austria was not totally defeated, but there was an exchange of territories as per usual, most of them in what we'd consider Poland once again. Uh, but Napoleon kept part of the territory and gave it to his Grand Duchy project that he's building and gave some to Russia as a reminder, like, hey, we're still cool. Yeah. This is where uh, Napoleon really fucked up the relationship, giving part of the territory to Warsaw. Now, when I say Warsaw, I mean his, uh, I mean Napoleon's version of Poland, not Russia's version of Poland. 
it pissed off Russia pretty bad. The further growth of the nominally Polish state was a was a, a direct threat to the a huge swath of Russia because hypothetically, if Napoleon wanted to fuck with Russia, he'd be like, "I'm restoring the kingdom of Poland," and then half of fucking the Russian territory outside of what we consider normally Russia would now be in rebellion. Oh, it's a huge stab in the back. Though Napoleon kept telling everybody that he never had any intention of restoring Poland, not even as a puppet. Because if he was going to do it, he could have done it a long time ago, and Russia couldn't have done shit. Right. Uh, but nobody trusted him, because he's Napoleon. Why would they? Yeah. In order to ease this, Napoleon offered that they sign a joint declaration that neither of them support the idea of Poland or Polish independence. Alex rewrote the declaration, omitting any notion of the Polish people altogether, uh, because it wasn't even allowed to exist on paper, I guess. Uh, Napoleon wasn't cool at this version because uh, tens of thousands of Poles fought in Napoleon's army, and he thought that would kind of be insulting to them. Okay. Alex countered with the fact that if Napoleon didn't sign his version, he might find it kind of hard to keep up with this whole continental system. Uh, Obviously, this little move began to make Napoleon suspicious as to what the Tsar's real plans were. Being Napoleon, he voices displeasure, as he always did, by summoning the Russian ambassador and screaming at him for a while. (laughs) That's awesome. He did that a lot. <laughs> For funsies? He's like, give me the ambassador. And then he, w- he won't even let the ambassador speak. You just scream at him. This is a one-way conversation. Yeah. I just need somebody to yell at. You stand there and take it. Uh, but after this little fit, he let slip the idea that, hit, uh, that leaving his side and making peace with England and leaving the continental system would mean war against France. This is the first time he'd ever brought up war. With, oh. And he just kind of screamed it out. He's like, fuck. Showed my hand. Times when you get angry. Yeah. You black out sometimes. He seems like a blackout angry type of guy. He seems like someone who will say the most extreme shit while he's mad. Because yeah. he at the time he did not mean it. He's like, shut up, baby. You know I love you. I didn't mean to hit you like that. <laughs> it reminds me of Bender. No- <laughs> Napo- shut up, baby. I know it. Uh the fucking what was uh, what was Bender's last name? It's like Bender, ben, Bender Bending Rodriguez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Napoleon Bender Rodriguez. Uh, now, Napoleon did not want war with Russia. And that was the first time he'd ever brought it up. And he's like, fuck, God damn it, my bad. <laughs> you already said it. Takes you back. Yeah. But Russia was beginning to look forward to the idea of war. Ooh. The Russian people hated France and especially Napoleon. And the upper class of Russia hated France for a whole a lot of different reasons. A lot of them really don't make sense. It all kind of boils down to uh, they were jealous uh, of of being the dominant culture in Russia uh, because they were full of Frenchmen who had ran from the French Revolution. Oh, uh, You see, French culture largely dominated all of Europe. It was the cultural touchstone of the entire place, kind of like American culture is today. You can't go anywhere without seeing American culture bleeding into people's lives yeah. are bad. Uh, and Russia was no different at the time for French. Russia was still playing keep up with the rest of Europe, and Russian nobility filled the void uh, with French culture as a sign of how civilized they were. Uh, this literally included everything down to the fact that they spoke French amongst each other. Like, they didn't even speak Russian. No, like, really? Russia was seen as like a peasant's language to them. That's crazy. The Russian army swelled with French aristocracy that ran from the guillotine uh, and filled the Russian state administration. This happened so completely that by 1812, when the war started, only one senior officer in the Russian army did not speak French. Yeah. Wow. And uh, many members, like there's many other members who are German, um, Austrian, Prussian, whatever. Uh, the, the Russian government was largely not controlled by Russians. <laughs> okay. It's weird. Despite all of this Franco-centrism, there was a general hatred for the country of France herself. Uh, it's, it's really strange. Uh, despite the fact that they loved and just consumed everything French, they hated France. There's a lot of hate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot, maybe a lot of this had a lot to do with getting their asses stomped in by Napoleon uh, in the last war. They just considered, and they considered the Treaty of Tilsit like a huge spit in their face. The hate only amplified. So you know where this is going when there's like a culture war brewing and, and they're like, hmm, we need to figure out a way to stop this. Xenophobia! <laughs> Anti-French papers began to be printed, as long with a strong urge to return to our traditional Russian values. In Russia, they printed these? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, Despite the fact that, that most Russian peasants could not read. 
So like this is solely for the nobility. Uh, people began to police the Russian language and the strong foreign influences in literature. So like if you were speaking amongst nobility people, it's like, hey, why the fuck are you speaking French? Yeah. Are you not Russian? Like, oh shit, my bad. Uh, and this is like this new wave of nationalism in Russia was kind of new. Nobody really had it before because before they're like, we need to civilize us. We need to improve our country. We'll take from France because they just went through all this. Right. There was no like, we must build upon strong Russian culture and traditions. And I use the term civilized loosely. It's in common knowledge. It, it just means, you know, improve, whatever. I don't mean that Russia was a horrible, backward, savage place Fucking or anything. Barbarians. Like that. Yeah. Goddamn savages. <laughs> no, no, it's not the case. This is the language that the nobility of Russia used. So it's like they absorbed somebody else's culture along with a fucking ton of immigrants from France. And they were immigrants who ran from the French Revolution because they would have been killed in it. Most of the, uh, like, uh, from the ancient regime under Louis, they all ran to Russia or Prussia or, you know, what we'd consider Germany now. Right. Because it's like, you know, this or I'm going to die. So they brought with them an intense hatred for France and Napoleon. Because, like, motherfucker stole my house. <laughs> they, he wanted to kill me because I was taking money from all the goddamn poor people who had no money. That monster. Now he has money. Yeah. And then they hated him even more because they were nobility under the old regime. So they wanted, like, their claims back. Their peerage was dead. Oh. So, like, yeah. they were. It's like all the... the the Cubans in Florida uh, who are really pissed off because the Cuban revolution happened and forced their fucking slave owning de- uh, great grandfather to lose his plantation. <laughs> like, but now I'm not rich anymore. <laughs> My grandpa was <laughs> came from Cuba to Florida. Uh, bad news. Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm going to assume from your, your father who had to join the NYPD or NYPD, the LAPD what? for a living wage. He was not a plantation owner in Cuba. No. <laughs> <laughs> Most of these people all work for like, I don't know, the Federalists now. <laughs> he definitely went across a boat you have to put your lips to. Not a good sign. No. Yeah. 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 So like this new wave of nationalism in, in, in Russia was totally, totally new. Uh, and they, they dealt with it. Now, that did not mean they kicked out the French because they still needed them. They're like, we're modernizing our military, we're modernizing our economy, our government. You guys can keep running things. Just keep it down a bit. Stop being so French. <laughs> um, but this kind of can't, like, uh, one of the things it is, like, they shamed people for hiring French. Like, yo, you hired a French tutor for your kid. Why don't you want him to learn Russian? Oh, you married a French maid. Why don't you want to marry her? Or why don't you want to fucking uh, hire a Russian? Shit like that. We don't see that today at all. Nope. Uh, <laughs> moving on. It was around that time that uh, Napoleon created uh, the Grand Duchy that we talked about. Um, so as you can imagine, he created the Grand Duchy, um, and this sparked like the just nationalistic fire to sweep through Russia because he's taken our Poland. It, dumb. Yeah. I know. Yeah. They thought this is a dire threat to Russia. Uh, and Napoleon, who, remember, they thought who was legitimately the Antichrist, or at least the demon adjacent, uh, was about to invade and finish his subjugation of Russia once and for all that he began with Tilsit. It's dumb. Yeah. Um, but not entirely wrong. He did want to dominate Russia. He just didn't want to have to invade them to do it. Uh, and then, I mean, to make matters worse, Napoleon managed to put one of his marshals, a Frenchman named Jean Bernadotte, on a place uh, uh, in place at the crown prince of Sweden, who, remember, ran the board with Russia. Nice. So it's like, now he's surrounding us with his loyalists. They're on our flanks. Yeah, I, and, and it's pretty interesting to point out that, like, Bernadotte and uh, Napoleon fucking hated one another, but they, like, uh, he knew that Bernadotte kind of had an in, so Napoleon supported him to marry into the family, become crown prince, and eventually become uh, king. Okay. Uh, and his, like his, the house of Bernadotte is still the royal house of Sweden today. Really? Yeah. Oh. So, like, he thought, well, he's, he'll be a Frenchman, so he'll be on my side. First of all, huge fuck up. Second of all, this is a fuck up in two different ways. Bernadotte hated Napoleon, like I said, and putting a Frenchman on the on few, eventually putting a Frenchman in line for the crown of Sweden pissed off the Russians even further because now they were under the, they, I mean, they were under the the same notion that Napoleon was that. He would be a puppet em- uh, king to the French emperor. So it's like, oh, God, we're surrounded by French puppets now. He's moving in for the kill. 
Oh. And all it seemed this, like the... All this happened pretty rapidly, too. So it yeah. all looked like a one big move. Yeah. It really wasn't. <laughs> the Russians seemed like that one guy in the movie in the foxhole that's really paranoid. Everywhere they look, they see another French plot. Yeah. Um, and then if he it was to piss off some... like If Napoleon was like maybe like, hey, man, I don't mean it. Maybe he could postpone this a little further. But then he annexed the Duchy of Oldenburg, which is largely unimportant. But the guy who happened to run that slice of land was Alex's brother-in-law. <laughs> so now he's like directly attacking his yeah. family. <laughs> I mean, in-law. Yeah, I mean, know. I would totally annex my in-law's backyard. I mean, I don't see a problem with it. And if Napoleon did it, I'm like, yeah, whatever. They have a nice backyard? Yeah, I guess. Oh, they have okay. a backyard. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Better than yours. And that was when Alex decided to flow out, uh, fly off the handle and said, quote, blood must flow again. And that's when the real plans for war began. And that's where we'll pick up next week. Whatever. I don't even <laughs> you care, look, dude. You look deeply unhappy with this cliffhanger. I wanted 1812. Bam, go. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's not that easy. No, it never is. It never is. Uh, but I promise violence and, and people dying of dysentery is coming quickly. My favorite. You know, you know what? Comes pretty quickly. Dysentery. When you're, oh, okay. When you're Mar- when you're, uh, where'd you think I was going with that? Um, <laughs> Napoleon, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, thank nice. you for tuning in to <laughs> part one of the French invasion of Russia. If you like what we do, you can check out our Patreon and throw us a dollar. You get bonus episodes. You get Discord access. You get to ask, ask us a question from the Legion, which we will answer at the end of the series because it's it's a series. It's our policy there. We're going to try selling feet pictures soon. Uh, actually, food buckets for the apocalypse is the new thing. Uh, that's like all the great grifter moves. They sell food buckets. Uh, I, if you open up like a Lions Led by Donkeys food bucket, it would just be like... It would be disappointing. It, it would be like a sealed taco from the gas station, a musket, and a bottle of liquor. And then on there, do you trust this toxo, taco? Question mark. Just a picture of a guy shrugging. Yeah. Also, check out our Teespring store. I just uh, put a whole bunch of new designs on there. So if you like one, pick it up. You help support the show. If you've seen the new design, they are sweet. pretty fucking pretty sweet. Pretty fucking cool. I fucking loved it. It's, I was in Oregon looking at it. It's almost it's almost like cool things happen when you hire professionals. Like, I never do. Uh, but I did this time, and it turned out great. Uh, so until next week, uh, don't invade Russia, kids. Later.